It is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you all Senator Jerry Moran, the senior senator from the great state of Kansas. Senator Moran has served in the United States Senate since 2010 and was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 19, 1996, serving seven terms. He is a senior member of the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, which has primary jurisdiction over the insurance marketplace in the United States. He serves as ranking member of the Veterans Affairs Committee and serves on the powerful Senate Appropriations Committee, as well as the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, and the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee. During the 2014 election cycle, Senator Moran chaired the National Republican Senatorial Committee. Under his leadership, the Republican Party gained a net increase of nine seats, which marked the largest Senate gain in a midterm election since 1958, and effectively shifted power of the upper chamber from Democrats to Republicans. In 2018, during the last Farm Bill negotiation, Senator Moran played an important role protecting the federal crop insurance program, which faced the threat of being cut significantly. On a personal note, I have known and been friends with Jerry since he was in the Kansas Senate back in the late 1980s. When my dad died in 2003, Jerry gave a eulogy of him on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives and presented a copy of that speech to my mom. It hangs in a very important location at her house, the bar. Some of you may know that my son is a 2014 graduate of West Point and serves as a captain in the United States Army. He went to West Point by nomination of Senator Moran, and we are grateful for that. And finally, my niece Ashton, who is here as a young agent, worked for Senator Moran in both uh, Washington, here, and in Kansas, in his Kansas City office when she came back home. Jerry is not only a family friend, a friend of the insurance industry and this association, a great United States Senator, he's also a client and someone we greatly respect. Senator Moran. The music, I'm an old guy, and the music still seems like it's before me. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you this morning. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, Bob, I, I'm in here large part because uh, Bob Fee and his position with the big I is uh, finally being able to stand in front of all of you after his election and COVID uh, somewhat behind us. And uh, I want to pay tribute to uh, our home state uh, president of the big eye. Uh, it is always important, it's very valuable for uh, us at, in a state like ours to have leaders in national associations. And I congratulate him and commend him on his willingness to serve all of you and to serve the industry and most importantly serve your clients in the efforts to try to make certain that this association represents you and your clients well and has a strong voice uh, in regard to Washington, D.C. When business folks come to, to, to see me in, in the nation's capital, I'm always apologetic. I wish it was unnecessary uh, for you to be here. We're happy to have you here. It would be nice if you could come and just enjoy the history of this place and see the museums and not worry about what government might do to you and your business. We don't live in that world, and uh, we are here to try to help in any way that we can to make certain that uh, there is a bright future for independent insurance agents in Kansas and across the country. Um, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I am uh, influenced by growing up in a town of a couple thousand people. I represented a congressional district before I represented all of Kansas and the United States Senate. I represented a congressional district the size of the state of Illinois. The largest city is 40,000 people. I am a rural guy and I bring that to the nation's capital and I grew up with uh, independent insurance agencies in my parents' life, in my grandparents' life, and we started with an independent insurance agent when I graduated from college and after we got married and when we have a family and our children have followed the same practice. And we appreciate the model that you operate 
giving us uh, the independence of an agent that can uh, provide us with advice and suggestions and the best product under our circumstances. And uh, as Bob indicated, we've continued to be an, an, an agent. Uh, we've continued to have an independent agent, including his agency, uh, into uh, this stage of our lives. I'm a difficult, incidentally, if you can undercut the fee agency by cutting the fees, I'm a, but I'm a difficult, I'd be glad to, to consider uh, offering our business uh, to, to you. Uh, so the way this system works, I think, is there's competition and you can find me a better product, I'm, I'd be interested. Uh, but the, the challenge with us is that I need significant uh, coverage for things that might happen as a public official, and it apparently is very difficult to find uh, underwriters. So I never thought I would be so successful in life that I have uh, Lloyds of London uh, covering me uh, uh, and my, my uh, potential liabilities. That rural nature of me uh, also suggests, would suggest to you that I would pay a lot of attention to agriculture. And I, I've asked my Kansas agents what might I talk about, and several of them said, make sure that you highlight the importance of crop insurance. And I'm happy to do that. It's easy to do, it, do that. But before I do, I would say that I spend a lot of time trying to make sure that our agricultural producers, farmers and ranchers in Kansas and across the country have a, a future. And one of the reasons that is, is they're so important in the component of the, uh, the uh, economy of a community in which they live and work. But the other part of that is farmers and ranchers are one of the remaining businesses, uh, professions in which sons and daughters work side by side with moms, dads, and grandparents. And that's a way historically in this country that we have transmitted our values, our character, our integrity, our love of life, and understanding and appreciation of the way things work in the world is generationally grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren. And as I was thinking about the, this this morning and the, the role that agriculture, how much it relies upon crop insurance, it occurs to me that I would also should say that I would pay a lot of attention and care a lot about independent insurance agents because the way you conduct business is the same way that it is in farmers in regard to generational. I certainly know that with my own agency and their family, but I know that with agents across the country. It's a business in which sons and daughters work side by side with moms and dads, and I just saw your honoree this morning with his siblings, and it is a way that family can work together in business, and the circumstances that that occurs are becoming so few uh, and I'm pleased to, to tell you that I have another reason to be very supportive of the independent insurance model, which is because it has the same opportunities for moms and dads to pass on to kids the things that are important in life. And while you will come to me in Washington, D.C., and many Kansans and Americans do to complain about kind of the way things are, so many of the things that I wish that I could fix deal with the relationships between moms and dads and their children and grandparents and their grandchildren. And it's not a piece of legislation that we can pass. It's a, it's a circumstance of life in which moms and dads, grandparents care about other generations. And so congratulations and thank you for your, the way that you conduct your business that is certainly relationship with uh, your clients, but relationship with your family in a family business. I'd mentioned just a couple of, of of insurance things, and then I thought I might tell you what I think's going on in the United States Senate and kind of where we are. From an insurance point of view, um, the Federal Insurance Office, we will do everything we can. We, we, we've been involved in the effort since the passage of Dodd-Frank to minimize the, the pain and difficulty, but the disruptions and the intrusions that that legislation creates in the financial sector, and we'll continue our effort to try to make certain that the Federal Insurance Office does not expand its role we believe in state regulation and uh, localizing the way that our insurance uh, products are regulated, not by nationalizing, and we want to make sure that that legislation didn't create an opportunity for an excuse for the federal government to further engage in regulation of insurance products that you market. I, ah. now, that, now that I know that's an applause line, I'll say it again. Uh, and I, I mentioned crop insurance. We're getting ready for a farm bill. Uh, again, my farmers in Kansas tell me the most important uh, decision that I make in regard to, 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 to policy in Washington, D.C. 
related to farm programs is really something that isn't a farm program. It's crop insurance. It matters to them more than anything else that the government does in trying to, to uh, provide some evening out. This is a terrible time, at least at home, in agriculture. Commodity prices are hugely uh, increasing, uh, as everything else is. Uh, but that's the problem. Everything else is, too. The input costs for our agriculture producers are significantly higher, and our ability to uh, earn a living in agriculture is diminished. We need to have uh, income and disaster um, uh, yield uh, products that work well for our agriculture producers. And it's important for folks here who on so many occasions have made the attempt to rein in the um, the uh, reimbursement for providing crop insurance to know that this is a very difficult, cumbersome business. And if, it, if the agent is not compensated, it will not be a product that they will provide to farmers and, and ranchers who desperately need that business. And I, I walk lots of main streets of Kansas, and I always look for an, uh, an insurance agency. And when I walk in the door, I say, do you uh, sell crop insurance, and if the answer is yes, I offer my condolences. Uh, it is a challenging product to sell with lots of government uh, intrusion and bureaucracy. And then finally, the a previous administration a couple ago were very involved in this issue of independent contractor and the Department of Labor's efforts to, to eliminate the, the, the long-standing legal definition of what an independent contractor is. And we're trying, once again, to make sure that this administration uh, and the Depart its Department of Labor doesn't, uh, is not successful in their efforts to undermine this important legal standing of an independent contractor in the way that you operate your business. And uh, those are, I, I guess, my takeaway from my conversations with independent agents, and particularly those from Kansas, is just leave us alone, status quo, don't mess things up, don't make it more difficult. And it's a pretty good plea uh, for all of America to make sure that Washington, D.C. doesn't make life more difficult. Broadly, from my perspective, we want to make certain that, I mean, I think the issues that Americans uh, and certainly Kansans visit with me about inflation, uh, the border, uh, and uh, an energy policy, and Ukraine. And I would tell you that uh, in just my view is that Republicans and Democrats have spent way too much money. We turned the spigot off way too slowly when it came to COVID relief. We did some things that matter. I think the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, was hugely successful and valuable in keeping small businesses in business. Uh, but we just kept providing more money and more money and more money. I think it's $6.7 $6 trillion have been spent uh, on COVID relief, and virtually none of it, quote, paid for by reducing spending anyplace else. So the, there can be no surprise, while there are those who want to claim that inflation is a result of supply chain problems and coming out of COVID, and I, I don't want to d diminish or indicate that's not a factor, but what I know from growing up with parents who uh, survived the Depression, uh, you cannot spend money you don't have endlessly without a consequence. And we are going to pay and are paying the consequence. And I've, I, I don't intend to be terribly partisan here, but I've discovered in my uh, time in Washington, D.C., in my work in Washington, D.C., I don't live here. I travel every week. I'll be on an airplane tonight or tomorrow back to Kansas, and I'll be back here on Sunday or Monday. If you made me live here, I wouldn't take this job. And uh, so what I know about this is that the people who, my observation is the people who often claim to care about the poorest among us are those who promote policies that are the most damaging to the poorest among us. And inflation is one of the most damaging things to everyone, but certainly to those on the lowest income levels. And so spending money, while often perceived as taking care of people, ends up being something that is terribly damaging to them uh, and their families. So inflation at the top of the list, border security, uh, we often used to think that the, the, the control of our borders was important because somebody was coming to steal our jobs. One of the greatest concerns I have today about the future of our country is it seems that there are so many people who do not want to work. I don't know how this country has a future if the answer is I want to stay home. And um, we need people to work, uh, and we need people who love to work. And it's more than just a paycheck. It's a, it's a part of who we are as human beings, and it provides meaning and purpose to our life. But 
I would tell you that border security is certainly have labor issues, um, but the national security, the drugs, uh, the human trafficking is a reason for us to do significantly more than what we've done today, to date. And um, energy policy is related to inflation. I think it's crazy that we are in the, that uh, there are those in Washington, D.C. who on an ongoing basis advocate the uh, nearly immediate elimination of fossil fuels. It's not practical. Uh, perhaps it's because I'm rural and we produce a little oil and, and gas in Kansas, but the idea that electric vehicles are going to overcome uh, and meet all of our country's needs simply cannot be true, and it's a national security issue that the things that help, uh, that are necessary to manufacture the batteries generally lie outside the United States, and we're in a process of, um, of trying to eliminate, in fact, the federal regulators, we've just been through this with the Federal Reserve, they were, in my view, nominated because they had an agenda to try to make sure that no money was lent to energy companies that were involved in fossil fuels. That is not their role. It's Congress's policymakers. Uh, and again, um, I'll shorten this up because uh, uh, 15 minutes, I think, probably has come and gone, and that's the nature of what you've allowed me. I became the senior senator of Kansas. Uh, after Senator Roberts announced his retirement, people started congratulating me on becoming the senior senator, and I didn't know really what difference it made, only to discover that once I became the senior senator, I talk a lot more. Uh, and so I want to mention this energy policy is crazy because we were seeking energy from early on from Russia before they invaded Ukraine. Uh, so that doesn't have a lot to do with uh, whether or not we're having a clean environment. We still want to use fossil fuels. And then after Ukraine, Dakota, Venezuela, and Iran is absolutely uh, nuts. Uh, that's not a very senatorial word. It's very disturbing that we would do that. And uh, we need every source of energy that we can. We need to be energy independent. We need to be able to help those in Europe who are trying to wean themselves away from uh, those fossil fuels. I was on the border of Ukraine, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this. I was on the border of Ukraine about two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, uh, two kilometers from uh, the Ukrainian border, visiting with Ukrainian refugees. This is, this is a, we often say that a person can make a difference. In this, when we say that, we are often thinking about making a positive difference. Vladimir Putin is a person who can make a difference, who's made a terrible, terrible difference in the world. 700,000 school-aged children have left Ukraine, crossing into the European borders. Half of the people in Poland, half of the households in Poland now house, care for uh, Ukrainian individuals. Those children generally came without their mothers or their fathers, certainly without their fathers. Um, and the death and destruction is, uh, is overwhelming. There is no reason. Uh, there is nothing but evil involved in Putin's decision. This is a power play of extraordinary consequences. And um, we need to be doing, in my view, everything we can to make certain that the Ukrainians have the tools necessary uh, to succeed, to win. And while we've been slow, we need to do this more quickly. Uh, this is immoral. It would be immoral for us to give them just enough aid to survive, but not to succeed. And it would be wrong for us to give them only the capability of defensive materials without being able to attack the things that are attacking them outside Ukraine. Um, I, I rarely watch the news. Uh, I grew up with the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite, and when he, was con when he concluded his program, he told me that's just the way it is, and it generally seemed to be that way to me. Uh, in today's world, the news is just what you want it to be. Uh, although I discovered that Walter Cronkite, after he retired, was pretty darn liberal, liberal by my standards, and, uh, but he didn't deliver to the news, and I miss those days. And I would say that I happened to be watching the news. I, I made certain to tell people I was in a gym and the television was on and I was watching. I had to happen to see it because I don't want to think you, to, I don't want Kansans to think I was in a bar and the television was on. But I saw on, on this program, the reporter was in Ukraine and he was questioning young children in an orphanage. And it looked to me like a 10 or 11-year-old boy was the subject of the 
the, the questioning that I saw. And the question was something we ask kids often. Uh, what do you want to do when you grow up? So this reporter, this American reporter, was asking a 10 or 11-year-old boy in Ukraine, in a Ukrainian orphanage, what do you want to do when you grow up? And the answer to the question was, when I grow up, through an interpreter, when I grow up, I want to be an American. It is a reminder to us that there is still, despite all the challenges we face, the difficulty, the division in this country, there is still something special and unique about being an American such that someone halfway around the world, 10 years old, has concluded the best thing he could do when he grows up is to be an American. We ought to recognize that. We need to solve our problems here. We need to meet our challenges. We need to work better together. We need to not be divided on everything. Um, everything should not be Republican and Democrat. We need to make certain that we live up to this young boy's belief that America is the place to be. And it's also a reminder to me, and I hope to us as Americans, that we have responsibilities to others around the world who want to have a life somewhat like ours. And so while we can come to Washington, D.C. and, and um, advocate for our causes, and they are important. We still have a huge responsibility as Americans to make certain that the freedoms and liberties that are guaranteed by our Constitution are preserved for us, expanded around the world, available to our children and grandchildren, and to make something that you all are living and something that this boy in Ukraine wants to live, something that we call the American dream. When you get up and go to work, you are fulfilling, I hope, your dreams. And in the process of fulfilling those dreams, you are helping others fulfill theirs. There is something noble and important about this, and America is one of the few places in which dreams, fulfillment of one's dreams, are not guaranteed to be met, but are you are given, we are given the opportunity to see if we can't fulfill those dreams. And don't ever let us lose the chance to be the country that has freedom and liberty that allows us, all of us, one at a time, to figure out what it is that we can do that makes life meaningful and gives other people a chance to make their lives meaningful with a bright future. I appreciate the agents that I know and how they live their lives and who they are and what they do in a community. And it's really important that we engage. I spoke at a funeral in McPherson, Kansas, over the weekend, and uh, the person I was memorializing, what I concluded about him, he never really talked politics to me, and he wasn't a politician. And I've concluded that we don't really need more politicians. We need more people who are interested not in politics, but in civics. Could we all just be a little bit better citizens, and this country will be just fine. Thank you very much for allowing me to join you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Moran, for being here and for your words. We appreciate it. Thank you.